So we have uh, Paul Rouse, Professor of History at UCD and author of Sport in Ireland, a history in studio. We're continuing to look back at some of the great Irish stories and Paul, Pat O'Callaghan uh, has to feature large. We have never had much Olympic success. Uh, Pat O'Callaghan had quite a bit all on his own. Until, um, until Michelle Smith, um, we had no, in, after the independence, uh, after the establishment of the Irish Free State, we had never um, had an individual to win more than one Olympic gold medal and, and Pat O'Callaghan was the first. Yeah, so we're talking, if we're going through Irish Olympic medals, I just printed it off, so we're talking um, O'Callaghan's two, Bob Tisdall in LA as well, where O'Callaghan won his second. We're literally on to Ronnie Delaney in 56, Michael Carruth, 92, Michelle Smith, 96, and then Katie Taylor, 2012. That is it. So Well, it's not it, though. Okay, go on. It's not it because there were 25 Irish gold medals from before the establishment of the Free State, okay. won by individuals such as Martin Sheridan and Paddy Chicken Ryan and people like that who won, who won them in either as independent athletes or representing America, South Africa or, or, or Great Britain. Okay, but Free Staters? For in terms of, of, of from, from, from the partition of Ireland and the establishment of the Irish, of the Irish Free State onwards, that's, that's your list. Okay, so it's a short list. So Paddy Callaghan, uh, certainly he was the first to win on behalf of the Irish Free State. Um, Kant yes. Herkman, County Cork by the age of 20 he was qualified as a doctor in 1925 uh, a bit like Morris Davin the other week these are all high achieving types so he's a doctor yes and he's uh, he won a scholarship to go to the Royal College of Surgeons um, trained to be a doctor qualified uh, left the minute he finished there he signed up for the Royal Air Force he'd won a scholarship to go to, to college had to make some money when he comes out joined the Royal, Royal Air Force Medical Corps mm. on a, what was called a short service engagement um, and left that and then moved to Clonmel in County Tipperary where he lived the rest of his life almost entirely the rest of his life mm. um, where he worked initially as um, a assistant medical officer in St Luke's uh, Mental Hospital as it was then called and served also as a general practitioner in the town. It seems his relationship with the Hammer starts in his college days around UCD. He would have seen the Hammer. He saw people training in at the UCD grounds. UCD then had sports grounds in in Terenure. Mm. Um and uh, while while in college in Dublin, O'Callaghan seems to have seen hammer throwers at work um, in that area. Now, I, I think he might have seen them before then. I think it's logical to expect that he might have seen yeah. them in sports days. But this was the time that he really got up close and he picked up a hammer and it just he was to the manor born okay his training regimen is interesting he uses a cannon he, he used well he used a cannonball he didn't use the cannon sure um, he, he, he used the cannon that would be impressive that would be seriously impressive he yeah. went down to McCroom Castle and he picked up what he considered to be a 16 pound weight a cannonball of 16 pound weight and he brought it home yeah. uh, with him and he brought it to um, a foundry and had it drilled right and through the, the, the hole that was drilled and he fitted a handle and a wire and he used it to, to train on the family farm uh, and it bore immediate dividends. In 1926, he won um, two. He won two hammer titles. He won the shot put title and then won a hammer title. And the following year, in 1927, he won the Irish Hammer Throwing Championships. A late developer in terms of starting the sport, mm. but almost an immediate success. Success, right? So that brings us. I mean, uh, it's kind of meteoric, really, when you when you lay it out in those terms. So two years after winning that first title in 26, he's going to the 1928 Games in Amsterdam. Yes, and this is um, the story of the, the story. Of, Ireland had sent a team to the twenty-four game games. It had sent a soccer team, which got to the quarterfinals. It sent uh, a series of athletes, including Larry Stanley, uh, the Kildare footballer who competed in the high jump. Um, it sent a couple of tennis players, and it sent two artists. So it sent Jack B. Yates, who won a silver medal for the Liffey Swim, mm. and Oliver St. John Gogarty, who won a bronze medal for a poem that he wrote. At that stage, there were cultural competitions as part of the, the Olympic Games. But this team goes in 28. and How big a team? Not a big team at all. You're looking at a couple of dozen people. And they send over a team. And um, this team, they're not expected to win medals. And certainly... Uh, Pat O'Callaghan isn't expected to win a medal he's only there because he had won the Irish title that year in 28 and he goes over um, he's he's a complete unknown yeah. in the international circuit his previous best before he went was about 166 feet he'd thrown the hammer which is a long way to throw the hammer but each of the main contenders 
who were in the competition had thrown well over 170 feet. Um, and when the Hammer event was staged in Amsterdam in July 28, it was on the 30th of July, he was he threw above himself yeah. for the first few rounds. Um, and he was lying third, which was seen to be an incredible achievement for where he was. He'd thrown two feet further than he'd ever thrown it previously. Um, and then with his, the, the Swedish favourite was ahead already, uh, Ossian Skald was in control, not throwing as well as he normally would, but still throwing because of conditions, the the, the distance people were throwing was quite back. And then mm. with his second last throw, um, O'Callaghan stepped forward and just he just nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. He threw it further than he'd ever thrown the hammer. And um, he became the first athlete from the Irish free, free state ever to be crowned an Olympic champion. Mm. Q huge excitement across the country it's a massive story it's a big deal uh, O'Callaghan's a nationalist as well isn't he he came home and he I, if you say he wrapped the green flag around him it sounds, sounds a little bit cynical it wasn't cynical at all he was a he was he was a, an ardent nationalist right so two things happened the first was when he came home he, he went back to his home there was a homecoming for him as there always is and this was down in Kenturk and he said I am not. I am glad of my victory, not of the victory itself, but for the fact that the world has been shown that Ireland has a flag, that Ireland has a national anthem, and in fact that we have a nationality. Mm. And this is this notion around the Olympic Games. I mean, this notion of the Olympic Games is apolitical or some sort of um, kind of soft uh, um, thing in which is just sporting. Is, is rubbish of course it's an, sure. it's an opportunity for, 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 for the symbols of nationalism to be put on display and that's exactly what O'Callaghan so O'Callaghan took, took that opportunity and at the same time the second thing that mattered was at that time the Talchin Games were then in, in, in train in Ireland in 1928 so the Talchin Games were kind of like an Irish Olympics to celebrate the fact of Irish independence staged in 1924 1928 and 1932 mm-hmm. And here is O'Callaghan, the Olympic champion, home to compete in those games two weeks after he had won his, his gold medal. Um, and there are brilliant photographs from the period of O'Callaghan walking with Queen Talcha, um, this, this, this actress called Nancy Rock, who was mm. dressed up, as you would imagine, a kind of a, a cross between a Celtic and a Greek goddess would look at, marching behind two extraordinary wolfhounds as big as ponies, walking in front of them. And it's this, this, the imagery was of Irish nationalism and success. Yes, and you've got this six foot one, 16, 17 stone hero. Extraordinary man who is an immediate star, right. who shoots from being somebody who's, who's known where he works and where he studied and where his family was to somebody who's now internationally famous. And what kind of character or personality is he? Does he like this? Does he like the fame? Does he embrace it? He, he is comfortable with it, okay. but he doesn't seek it. He's somebody who, who is more than... He was a genial figure who was, seems to have been loved by all who, who, who he met. Mm. And he seems to have been an incredibly decent man and a very kind man. Um, and he, he trains and trains and trains through 28, 29, 30, 31 and 32 because he is determined to go to the Los Angeles Olympics of 1932 and retain his gold medal. I was going to ask about that, actually. So clearly he trains because he goes to LA, which we'll talk about now in 32. I'm thinking of Roger Bannister, who, and for him, clearly it was it was a pastime, and he did extraordinary things. But I mean, his medical studies and profession was by a distance the most important thing in his life. Do we know where O'Callaghan's priorities lay? Oh, his priorities were work as well. I mean, he was he was a worker, but he fitted in both things. He was driven in athletics as well. You can't, and I don't believe that Roger Bannister not driven by athletics as well. Roger Bannister was utterly determined to do what he was doing. I accept all that stuff that he was primarily a doctor. Mm. But that doesn't mean that he wasn't utterly committed to athletics as well. Mm-hmm. Like he was driven, he was, he was a perfectionist I think more than anything else and I think this is it with O'Callaghan. O'Callaghan really wished to go back and, uh, and, and win gold in, in, in L.A because he would go in as favourite, yes. as defending champion. And through 31 and 30, he's, he's throwing just great distances. And he went to Los Angeles as a strong favourite. It comes down to a dramatic last throw, though. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, this is not a straightforward, routine gold medal win. And a great story on Ireland's most successful day in, in, in the Olympic Games, because um, just before, or while they, they hammer tra- throwing competition is going on, Bob Tisdall, 
was competing in the 400 metres hurdles for Ireland and won gold. Yeah. And there's a great image where afterwards the two of them, um, Tissel wanders over to a Callaghan. Oh, Callaghan's struggling. Like he's not, he's not performing as he was expected to perform. It looks like it's, it's drifting away from him. The Finnish champion, Vila Parola, looks like he's going to win it. Mm-hmm. And um, O'Callaghan said to Tisdall that he was struggling with his spikes. He couldn't get a grip from the spikes in his runners. And Tisdall helps him file down the spikes, as told by both of them, before this last throw. And with his last throw, he just ripped it. Hmm. Threw it 176 feet, that's seven feet further than he had thrown it for the previous time, um, and became the only Irish person at that point in history to win two gold medals. Wow. The image of Tisdall helping him file his spikes, what would you give for some footage of that? They were brought back to the uh, arena in the early 80s by a documentary crew, and the two of them wander around. It's just a beautiful imagery of the two of them walking around telling me, telling the story. Wow. Amazing. Um, and it was again he came home in 32 just like he's he's an athletic god <laughs> he's, he's the stage. man yeah I mean it's, it's, it's obscene for any Ashley, uh, Irish athlete to go and win a gold medal to retain it in LA on the day that Bob Tisdall wins a gold as well is too much to handle not least because while he was over there his profile was such in, when he was in Los Angeles that he was brought on tours of, of the studios and all of that so Sam Goldwyn the, the great film star offered him the role of Tarzan uh, while he was there so he, he to, to see would he obviously his physique was extraordinary he's perfect for, for that he has the looks he has everything mm. and he, he declined it he wanted to go home he got to play handball with Bing Crosby while he was there um, but he turned it all behind him and he, he came back to Ireland after the games to a hero's welcome processions everything kind of wish he'd played Tarzan I must admit would have been something <laughs> but the man who did play Tarzan was Johnny Weismuller, who who um, who actually had won the uh, the gold medal in the twenty four games and had come to the Talchin, Tal- Tar- uh, Johnny Weismuller came to the Talchin Games yeah. in Dublin, and he won the gold medal in the swimming in the Talchin Games, and the final of the swimming took place in the pond in Dublin Zoo. So there's this <laughs> the man who played Tarzan swam and swam in the pond in Dublin Zoo. It's a strange world, actually. History proves that, if nothing else, that these mad things are happening. So, we've Pat O'Callaghan here, 28 games in Amsterdam, 32 games in LA. He is a superstar. And um, everything being correct with the world and straightforward, he would go to Berlin and make it a hat-trick of gold medals in 1936. But politics intervenes. He's, He's going so well, athletically, that in 1934... He threw the record for the hammer in European soil. He'd gone on and gone on, and he'd now gone and hit 186 feet. Wow. For the guy who was doing, what, 166? So, so he's just... Amsterdam. Yes. So now he's put 20 feet onto it in, 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 eight, years. in eight years. And he's getting stronger and stronger. And actually, later on, um, two years after that, he, he throws as far as 195 feet, which, again, is, 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 is enormous. So he won the American Hammer Championship as well in 1933. Went over and competed against and considered to be the best hammer throwers in the world and he beat them. He went to the British Championships in 33, and he won again. And amazingly, while all of this is going on, he also competes as a high jumper. <laughs> so not just as a powerful man, he's also a, um, agile. And agile. Yeah. So he jumped six foot two to win the Irish um, High jump championship on three occasions, 1929 to 1931. Of course he does. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> while waving to the crowd, no doubt. <laughs> so uh, politically, what's the issue then? Why can't he go and, and uh, seal the deal and make it three? Well, there was a boycott of the 36 games called, and there's huge dispute through 35 and 36 globally over the staging of the games in Berlin mm-hmm. because what's becoming clear is Hitler's Hitler is revealing himself year after year. Mm-hmm. And the policies are such that people are beginning to lobby that there should be a boycott. Yeah. But this has nothing got to, the, to, to do with the reason why the Irish team uh, ends up not going. This is a very local dispute, which is all about partition. The British Olympic Committee and the British, Athletic, uh, Athlet, the British Athletics Associations, I mean, were arguing that all athletics associations could be, should be and must be contiguous with national boundaries, which meant that the then governing body for Irish athletics, the NACAI, was claimed to be a part a 32 county organisation. So the British triage said, "No, no, that's 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 not 
that's not acceptable. Mm-hmm. And, I, and they essentially mount a campaign with the International Amateur Athletic Federation to say that either the Irish governing body, the NACAI, accept that there is a 26 county, 26 county delineation on their power, yeah. or they must step out of the games. And the Irish Amateur Athletic Federation, or sorry, the International Amateur Athletic Federation, decide in 1935 that the Irish athletes who give authority to that body cannot go to the games, okay. cannot, cannot compete. And Pat O'Callaghan with his uh, flag wrapped around him, I dare say knows where he stands in the matter. Well, certain members of the, I, uh, of the Irish governing body set up a new association, the Irish Amateur Athletic Union, with a view towards being 26 county okay. and going to the Olympic Games. Yeah. And of course for O'Callaghan the temptation must be Huge. Just, I'll do that. Yeah. I'll go there. I will, I will win again. Yeah. Because nobody can touch me. But he absolutely declined. Now, his stock is so high at this stage that he was invited to Germany in 1934 to Hamburg to give hammer throwing exhibitions. The Germans then are supposed, they sent, they come and film the Irish hammer throwers because they want to base their technique on what O'Callaghan did. He was going to go to Berlin and he was almost certainly going to win. Um, now he did go to Berlin but he travelled as, as a tourist yeah to watch it he, he was, went to he watch was, it he was in the stands watching it and he saw the throw that won not even come close to where God, where he would where he would get to he must have been hugely tempted yes you would imagine so um, did he ever speak about it because obviously he, he lived until 1991 I presume were there interviews did he talk he expressed he expressed um, disappointment that he couldn't do it but no regret and um, there was, this was now incredibly cantankerous. I, I presume the country was uh, more, largely because of O'Callaghan disgusted that he wouldn't be going. Yes, and there's a, the, the dispute, those, those, the, the language that was used in the dispute between the now two rival Irish athletics bodies is like, was extreme. Mm. So you have, um, you have people, like the sense of a lost medal, we should say in the first instances, the year after... Uh, that he threw at that 195 metres in, in Fermoy okay. um, so breaking the old world record by 6 feet okay. so he's at his peak in 36 but it didn't count because of course it wasn't recognised by the Irish by the international amateur right, okay. so he lost in he lost in every shape or form um, and this was an incredibly bitter dispute in which the government now became involved and um, the NACAI tried to get Eamon de Valera to come in and say look to recognise them and do that and they wrote a memorandum to government in which they said there is little doubt that political intriguing by interested parties in the six county area and in England has resulted in the current impasse. It is part of a very determined attempt to consolidate the border within Ireland and to emphasise the civilian political life of the country is partitioned. So they were saying look this is part of partition they yeah. want to, they want to split this and they blame Trinity College Dublin and other leading athletics clubs as playing a leading part uh, in 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 driving this within Ireland and accepting it, and they said by our thing, by our by contrast, we are standing for the ideal of a united Ireland. Uh-huh. How does that dispute finish up? Um, well, you won't be surprised to know that it lasted until the nineteen sixties um, <laughs> with the with a kind of um, a kind of a unity of uh, of kind of an agreement on the formation of BLE. Although even that led to subsequent split, um, and it meant that people were condemned as as a band of traitors and you by the way this split was also there and visible in cycling yeah there was a, there was a band of cycling fellas who went anyway didn't they to some yeah and it ended up in a, in a, in say for example at the world amateur cycle race championships in 1955 yeah. uh, two rival groups of irish cyclists punching the heads off each other at the starting line that's right yeah to a, to a competition but there were also splits there were also disputes in sports such as uh, there were problems encountered rather than splits between hockey and golf and bridge. So this wasn't just yes. athletics and, and soccer. Yeah. I'm feeling incredibly sorry here for Pat O'Callaghan, I must say. So post-1936 and the image of him sitting in the stands, as lovely as the thought of him and Tisdall in LA in 32 filing the spikes and ready to win gold medals, the image of him sitting in the stands in Berlin watching inferior athletes take his gold medal is, uh, is terrible. Uh, post 36 he seems to go to America for a time was there an incident where yeah, a child was killed this, see, this is this is where I can't quite get this one Okay, but it looks like there was a child killed by a flying hammer which led to uh, O'Callaghan or at least after that just before the war 
and this probably puts in huge perspective any disappointment he might have felt about yes. about not going to Berlin and he, he left to, to to go to America and he took up professional wrestling so d- you're vaguely circling around who threw the hammer there I don't know be- I don't want to say it was him yeah. um, because I haven't found the full the full story Sorry. Okay. If I do find the full story, I will do it, but I haven't found it. Fair enough. Well, then we'll, we'll, we'll hold our peace. But there is an accident of some sort, and he seems to emigrate to America shortly afterwards. Yeah, and he, he took up professional wrestling, kind of like that forerunner of of the WW, whatever it is now. E. And yeah, and and uh, the Irish were massive in wrestling in America at the time. There's people like Dan O'Mahony, who was the world wrestling champion at the time, and the Casey brothers from Sneem, and various other people <laughs> who are who are huge figures in this world of of uh, athletics. And um, but O'Callaghan was no Egypt. He uh, he fought, but he understood that he wasn't going to beat O'Mahony, and that this was a bit of a sham. So he did it for a while. Yeah. Uh, before he came home and. After all the glamour of, um, you know, potentially being Tarzan and potentially fighting in a major wrestling stage and winning Olympic medals and doing all of those things, he he was a prominent member of Clonmel Commercials Gaelic Football Club and later became president of that club. I should say, by the way, that he's one of these guys who defied the ban during all these years. He played a bit of rugby when he was at Dublin. So when he was in Dublin, interesting so. for the nationalists. Yeah, you see, this is the thing. Eamon de Valera was a rugby player. Yeah. Eamon was well, there, there's full of contradictions and, and, and um, areas of grey, aren't there? And he managed, I see, Clonmel to three senior county championships as well in the 60s. Um, so, I mean, he continues, he, he, he continues to work as a, a GP in the end in Clonmel, where he sees out his days, and is talked about as almost kind of living legend, very kind man, kind to poor patients. Gets made the freeman of, of Clonmel in 1984. Uh, he was known as the Doc or Dr. Pat. He was kind of a, seen as being humble and charming and kind of jovial. And he um, he was a kind of a larger than life figure in the town. Every small town has sure. people like this. And, and uh, this this is this is the way he was. And um, he, he died on the 1st of December um, 1991 and um, you know, left behind a wife and three kids. Wow. Some life. Yeah, a very fascinating life. Mm. Uh, Paul Rouse, as ever, thanks very much. You're very welcome, Joe. Hey, hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here. All our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out.